I would put music and some audio cues in this intro, but I don't have any. Sorry. Dark, serious, dark, serious, dark, dark, serious, serious, dark and serious, serious and dark. Serious, not so serious, not serious at all. Wait, now it's serious again. Why so serious? If there's one thing to say about Type Moon, it's that they managed to use their signature dark fantasy shtick and take it to a degree that's almost surprising if you think about it. From Kara no Kyokai to the more recently established Maho Tsukai no Yoru, each property or franchise has led to worlds that are genuinely fleshed out and connected. From characters, concepts, lore, and everything else in between, not one story is the same and each one can tackle subject matters and themes that the other might not, culminating in works that have captured many who experience them. And as someone who casually reads the Type Moon Wiki, there is a lot to take in, and my god can it be interesting to learn about. But when there's a serious push for worlds with individual identities, even featuring hints that they all might be interconnected in some fashion or another, this also means that they have the tendency to be grim with their exploration of the dark fantasy in the modern day setting, so not everything can be hunky-dory. Hell, even when something is fooled around with, shit can still get real. But what happens when you take out the seriousness or the darkness and boil each element down to their essence and add some sugar, spice, and everything batshit. Sounds like a strange hypothetical scenario definitely one that could potentially flop. So it came as a surprise that with the direction of Seiji Kishi and script by Makoto Uezu, we received our glorious answer in the form of a 12 episode OVA series called Carnival Phantasm, based on the Take Moon manga by Eri Takanashi. As a parody that unites all things Type Moon, the premise of Carnival Phantasm doesn't so much provide a plot, but invents a variety of different skits, gags, and over-the-top scenarios that not only joke about all things Type Moon, but but celebrates them. And though that formula might sound random and aimless, the truth of the matter is that because each one is based on something created in the Nasuverse, the jokes do have something to connect them to. From making fun of the Holy Grail War, to having a hugely comical scenario of seeing Berserker's way of casually shopping for batteries, to the epic finale where Fate and Tsukuhime protagonists Shiro and Shiki joined forces to literally try and date every single love interest in their respective series, there is not a moment where fun can't be had assuming you are remotely familiar with what they are trying to reference. But those are only the tip of the iceberg. That's not even accounting for all the little skits and easter eggs that are sure to make any Type Moon fan squee. But as cute and funny as Five Ren Cats is, it seems Carnival Phantasm leans more towards Fate than anything, which isn't surprising considering that Fate is, more or less, Type Moon's flagship franchise at this point. And because this is Fate Month, Tsukihime skits, Melty Blood skits, or all else that involves either of those series aren't going to be the spotlight as I review my top 5 favorite fate skits from Carnival Phantasm. It's on now, kitty vickies. Here we go. Number 5, Magicians Hate Machines. You know, it's one thing to see Rin Tosaka all serious or uptight, and it's another thing to see her freak out, not by someone trying to kill her, mind you, but by the most ruthless enemy she has ever faced, a Blu-ray player! Okay, that's not accurate. It's a Blu-ray recorder, and in this hilarious work of random genius, we see how much Omega struggles with those damn machines. Oh, what the press! What the plop into the drive! Oh, it's just too much for Reen to handle! Now, what makes this skit stick the landing for me, aside from the obvious, is how Archer comes in to try to help the situation, and Reen beats the fuck out of him, which helps keep the skit refreshing as she does everything in her limited know-how to figure things out. It's a simple method, but it sure is effective. Number four, Daydream. Elia might not have her own route, but that sure as fuck doesn't stop her from spending time with her favorite adopted brother in this glorious skit from episode three. Though, things might not be what it seems. In fact, it seems he's under a spell. Oh wait, he is under a spell, never mind. I guess it really is as straightforward as I thought it was. I love how the other characters try to get in on this intense sleeping action. Really makes Elia's reaction that much more fun to witness. And isn't that fitting? 
this is pretty much Elia's time to have her day, and yet, aside from the absence of Sakura, the other main love interests of Fate Stay Night are trying to hog him for themselves. Poor Elia, she just wants to spend time with Shiro, even if it involves a rather creepy method when you stop and think about it. Number 3, A Wise Man's Gift, Love Fate. Caster may die in every Fate Stay Night route, but that's not to say there isn't any material available to outright parody her in the most hilarious of ways. Case in point, this funny caster skit from Episode 7 that literally turns the mysterious, powerful, hooded mage into one of the biggest saber otakus ever. I mean, holy shit! She's way, way more obsessed with saber than my dumbass! Just look at all that stuff! She's got it all! Figures, saber outfits, kits, a wild imagination of wanting to dress saber and cute shit. I mean, she even gets a goddamn nosebleed, and I never got a goddamn nosebleed thinking about saber! But what makes this a really good skit for me is that, though Caster's saber obsession is definitely something to behold, in the end, it's her love for Soichiro that keeps it from descending into a single joke hodgepodge, especially when said obsession is something that could be used against her. But, like a lot of typical and contrived love stories, it's good to see that this one has a happy ending, even if it's thanks, in part, to good luck. Number 2, Saber at Work. What's better than Saber? Nothing really, or at least that's what I thought, until this magnificent skit from episode 8 that only dreams were made of. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Saber as a maid waitress! Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! What's there to say? Okay, aside from the obvious humor that can come from this cold stone, charismatic, and powerful king of knights working at a cafe, no amount of food can measure to how absolutely unbeatable this holy combination is, especially when she goes apeshit, pulls out her ahoga, and transforms into the dark and evil form we all love. I mean, even Gilgamesh, the largest stuffed asshole of the series, can't help but fall for this incredible display of sheer greatness. Not to mention that this skit gave birth to a quote so perfect that it accurately describes what I think of Devil Hamura. In short, a badass skit. But it's not my favorite fate skit. That goes to number one. The Holy Grail Grand Prix! From the references, the jokes, the play on characteristics of our cast, the Holy Grail Grand Prix from Episode 9 is nothing short of pure grade awesome. What's there to say that doesn't make this skit so awesome? It's the Holy Grail War, except instead of bloodshed through swords, it's bloodshed through ramming and speeding down the road in vehicles of different descriptions. Reed and Archer get a pink lowrider for that extra bling bling. Caster and Soichiro get that honeymoon touch. Shinji and Ryder get a bike. Berserker turns into a motherfucking car that shoots shit, and Shiro and Saber? Well, fuck. They only get the most badass vehicle ever conceived in the form of a kitty ride that's literally fueled by yen coins. Yen. Literally for the win. This skit just escalates and escalates as it goes on. It's actually what gives it its strength. Lancer rides off in a dragster and dies like he always does, for one. Assassin just kind of shows up, and Gilgamesh, like the dick he is, just pops out of nowhere and only adds to this crazy fest. It just keeps mixing things up, and man, does it make for some entertainment. This is so much fun to watch. The twists, the turns, the silliness, and the self-aware jabs at its own lore makes this not only something worth watching if you're a fan of the Fate series, since there's plenty to recognize and smile if you are, but on its own, you can't help but at least snicker at some of the things in store. And that accessibility is what gives this skit an advantage over for every other Fate Stay Night skit, and the conclusion is just perfect. No need to change it. So as much as I like seeing Saber in a Lolita maid outfit, I like the irresistible charm of the Holy Grail Grand Prix just a little more. And with that, you now know my top 5 favorite Fate skits from Carnival Phantasm. If you haven't seen this OVA yet, I highly recommend it to those who are remotely interested in Type Moon. Fate Stay Night especially, though I can imagine those who are unacquainted to be lost. It definitely revels in its own properties, but that's not to say that there's nothing to enjoy, even if you don't know who these people are. Carnival Phantasm is a bold celebration of everything Type Moon, but it's also a very solid comedy series if high energy, random humor is your thing. Then again, I was already kind of familiar with Type Moon beforehand, so that did help me understand some things. Knowing the context is recommended, and that can either be a good thing or a bad thing.